This video is sponsored by Factor 75. Get fresh, ready-made meals delivered to your doorstep when you sign up with Factor. Their menus are updated weekly. They have seafood, veggie, and keto options, if that's what you're looking for. Check my link in the description below and use code FACTORSE10507 for 60% off your first box. Guys, Biblical Gender Roles has made a political website. Now, not that his website already didn't talk about politics, but he has specifically made what is called the Biblicalist Report, uh, which is politics through the lens of a Biblicalist, which I've never heard that word until right now, but here we are. Uh, his tagline is current events and politics from a Biblicalist perspective. We're going to take a look at the website, and apparently he's got a very important article on here about capitalism and how it's biblical. But first, let's get into the fan art section. This one is from Mathematical Cabbage. Bubble, period. Bath, period. SFW, period. And then there's a there's a, there's a crossed out section here that says, check Mathematical Cabbage's Tumblr for the NSFW version. I... I don't even know what NSFW means, but thank you very much for the bubble bath. The next one we have here is from Sir Uncle Ned. After the terrible piece last time, I finally had a brainwave and whispered the right nothings into Dolly 2 and got this out of it. I need to make an announcement real quick while I'm thinking about it. So guys, I am not against you putting AI art into the uh, fan art section of the Discord. Uh, however... I have a rule, and I'm going to let that rule be known now. The rule is also pinned within the Discord. If you submit AI art, as Uncle Ned did here, and do what Uncle Ned did, please specify that it is AI art by letting me know that it's Dolly. I know it's AI. Um, because we do not want people seeing art that is generated by an AI, and despite the fact that it's very hard to mistake most of that art for art that has been made by a real person, still don't want those mistakes to be made. So if you do happen to see, if you do happen to submit art that is generated by an AI, please just be honest about that uh, in the actual area. It also helps because sometimes people search the fan art section for commissions. I know I do. Um, so yeah, just, just do that and we'll all be on the same page. Okay, cool. Also, don't use any other per artist's art as a base when you're making AI art, especially if you're submitting it as fan art. You don't have the artist's permission to do that, so please don't do it. Anywho. The next one we have here is from Aura Echoes. Felt like doing the witch outfit too. So we've got the witch outfit here in regular and slime mode in the Sonic style OC. As always, everybody, thank you all for your fan art submissions. If you want your fan art to be shown in a future video, the best way to do so is to drop it in the fan art section of the Discord. With that said, let's go ahead and get right into things with biblical gender roles. It literally, it literally just says capitalism is biblical. That's that's the name here. We don't even have to ask any questions. He just he just says it flat out. So let's go ahead and take a look here. Let's take a look at what is said here. The heart of capitalism is private property rights. In a purely capitalist society, each person retains 100% control of their private property, which includes all of the money they earn from their ideas, use of their lands or other properties, as well as their labors. America was founded on private property rights, and capitalism and the Constitution originally banned the concepts of income taxes. Now, let's go ahead and start right here, real quick. So the Constitution originally banned it, banning the concept of income taxes. I don't I don't give a shit. I, I feel like venerating the Constitution in any way, shape or form uh, is is kind of pointless. It is a significant document for founding our country, but any argument based on it for anything uh, ends up being a, an argument from tradition of some kind. If you venerate the Constitution more than I do, then, you know, that is a you thing. But me personally, I, I don't. I don't care. Secondly, the heart of capitalism being private property rights. I don't know if I 100% agree with this. The heart of capitalism is the ability to own capital, the ability for the means of production to be privatized. Um, 
I guess you could try to put that down to private property rights, but there's usually a misconception that happens uh, that we need to probably get into real quick when we're talking about private property rights. Uh, if BGR is meaning private property rights as in everything that is not publicly owned, uh, then I disagree with him 110%. However, if he means private property rights in the way that a Marxist usually understands them, then I might agree with the statement a bit more. Uh, it's not very clear, at least at this stage, because he does not properly define what is private property versus what is, say, personal property. That's the part that I need to know. Through a Marxist lens of looking at society, there are three types of property. There is private property, there is public property, and then there is personal property. Personal property is your car, your house, uh, usually the land that you stand on. Personal property can be your shoes, your toothbrush, everything within the house you own, the stuff you own. Private property, however, is that which that which creates goods, that which produces, that is what is considered private property. Usually within a Marxist sense, we are trying to argue that those things that which produce goods should be publicly owned as opposed to privately owned. Because several of those goods that are produced are things that we would consider human rights, like medicines, like uh, water, like food. So it should be, I, I, I bring all that up so that we have a clear definition of private property, public property, and then, of course, personal property before going forward with BGR. But let's go ahead and see what else he's got here. The United States government, including the military, was almost completely funded by something Trump is using today to crack down on China. Tariffs, taxes on goods coming in from foreign countries. So here's the problem with funding... Can can anybody tell me the problem with specifically funding the United States military with tariffs? Can you think of a handful of issues that might come up from doing that specifically? But just from from my perspective, I feel like funding the military, a force that we use in the United States to extend our arm of imperialism out, uh, to go into other countries, sometimes to invade those other countries, I feel like funding them primarily with taxes we have taken from other foreign countries. I feel like maybe there's a bit of a problem with that system, just a little bit. Whereas, despite my gripes with the United States military, funding it primarily through the money that comes out of the pockets of American citizens makes more sense to me. There were income taxes during the Civil War and some attempts at income tax afterwards until the courts ruled income taxes to be a violation of the Constitution. It was then that President Woodrow Wilson spearheaded the effort to put in a constitutional amendment for an income tax, promising it would be only a 1% tax on the very rich. This resulted in the 16th Amendment being passed in 1913. Fast forward just a couple of decades and then FDR raised the income tax to 95% on the rich to fund his socialist makeover of, the, of America. JFK lowered the top rate from 90% to 70 and then Reagan did the largest tax rate drop in history, lowering it to 28%. All right, so... All these numbers sound super scary, but let's go ahead and do our due diligence. Let's go through this bit by bit. There were income taxes during the Civil War. Cool. Uh, then the Supreme Court ruled that taxes were a violation of the Constitution. Okay. It was then Woodrow Wilson that spearheaded a 1% tax on the very rich. Neat. All this is telling me is that as our nation grew, as the needs of the nation increased, the needs for funding from the nation increased. As such the need to pull funding from the people who live within the nation increased. I myself am not against taxes. I am actually for taxes. I am for sales taxes. I am for income taxes. This is coming from somebody who had to drop several thousand dollars on income taxes one year because being a content creator is a bit of a pain in the butt. I'm not against taxes. My reason is that I like roads. I like schools. I like having access to a military to defend a country. I like 
those things. And having access to those things requires money coming out communally from everybody's pockets to fund those things. Now, there are other things I would like taxes to go to as well. Hell, if you increased uh, income tax by another couple of percent points, but you also happen to have a much more expanded homeless sheltering system, one that actually moved homeless people into government-funded housing as opposed to just in temporary shelters. I think that would be pretty fucking based. It's not like we have more houses in the United States than we have people living in it, and yet homeless people exist. It's not like we have no shortage of food in the United States per capita, per person, and yet hunger is still an issue that several families face every day. But that's just my view on taxes. Now, fast forwarding to the 95% tax rate uh, on the rich to fund a socialist makeover of the United States. So what is what? how rich would you have to be to have 95% tax on you? Hi, everyone. I'm Iluma. Well, let's go ahead and take a look. How much did you have to make? To make for 95% tax. Let's see here. So I know Sanders wants 95% tax on big corporations. But let's see here. Let's take a look at the context here. Let's take a look at the context here. How much can the U.S. president commit to the greater equality hope to accomplish when lawmakers are devoted to helping the rich hold the upper hand? Advocacy for equality must take a back seat. Obama administration deciders insist, but I don't care about it. What does it mean, though? Well, for the duration of Eisenhower's presidency, that rate affected individuals, individuals making $200,000 or more per year or couples making $400,000 and above per year. So here's what you might think that that means. Here's how people get scared. Here's how they get terrified, okay? They hear a 95% tax rate on $400,000. And mind you, $200,000 and $400,000 back in 1913 was a very different number than what it is now. So what? We go point times point 0.95. So what they hear is, you're taxing me at 95% on $400,000 you're taking 380,000 of my dollars. I only have $20,000 left. However, will I survive? Ignoring the fact that in 1913, $20,000 was plenty to survive off of. Holy fucking shit. You were living pretty damn well uh, if you were in 1913 America making 20,000. But here's the problem. It's not a flat tax. Here's what actually happens. Your first $10,000 are not taxed. Like your first eight to ten thousand dollars, not taxed. After that, every penny you make after that is taxed at about right now about twelve percent. So anything up to like forty-five thousand dollars, you'll get taxed at twelve percent on. So take twelve percent of forty-five thousand, or take twelve percent of thirty-five thousand dollars, because of course again, your first ten thousand dollars weren't taxed. How much money are you left with? Well, let's see here. We have $35,000 right here. We'll just go ahead and multiply it by 0.12. So we're just taking 42,000 off of that, or 4,200. So that is 35,000 minus 4,200 plus the 10,000 you weren't taxed on anyway. Oh, wow. So if you're making 45,000 uh, a year, you're still making 40000 a year after taxes, even at 12%. You know what this means? This means that by the time you hit 40000 even if you are taxed at 70% right before 40000 you are only taxed for every dollar you make after 400000 Not 70, 40, 70% at 400000 misspeaking, sorry. You are only taxed at that 90% for every penny you make over that 400,000 mark. Meaning that most Americans are still seeing hundreds of thousands of dollars of their paycheck if they are making 400,000 a year, even with a 90% tax on $400,000. That is what 
our tax brackets look like. We have marginal tax. We don't have a flat tax. Why is this important? Because when you see numbers like this and buzzwords like socialist makeover of America, when you see stuff like this, you freak out. Oh my God, if 90% of my income is taken away, however will I survive? But it's not that. It's never been that. You've never had 90% of your income taken away. Even people who have 90% of their income taken away do not really have 90% of their income taken away under this system. Because for every single penny they made before the $400,000 mark, they were taxed under a different tax bracket. Meaning again, they usually ended up with several hundred thousand dollars one, two, or three, before they ever hit that $40,000 mark, or $400,000 mark. So we should not be asking ourselves, why would you go 90% to 70% tax on people at these rates? However, will they survive? What you should be asking yourself is, wait, why didn't we keep that? Why didn't we keep those tax rates? I want you to think about how much money you make right now. I'm not saying, tell me how much money you make in the comment section below, because one, don't gloat. Two, uh, I, I I don't need that information. That's not important. I I don't I don't need to know which one of you I need to e-beg to. What I need to know though is think about how much money you make. If it is under a hundred thousand dollars, but above say fifty thousand dollars, do you consider that enough for you to survive? And not just survive like live, but is that enough for you to function day to day? Studies have shown at least about what ten years ago that. 10 years ago, 70,000 was about the, the threshold for happiness. It's probably closer to 80 or, or, or 85,000 now. But there is a point where you are no longer buying things for yourself for fun. You are just trying to get a bigger yacht. You are just trying to get larger uh, a larger house, a bigger TV. There comes a point of diminishing returns with the money that you have. If you can survive, live, thrive uh, with however much money you have right now, remember, that's with our current tax bracket, but also even a 90% tax bracket, if you make under 400000 you weren't seeing any of that money anyway. This literally never affected you. It didn't. And if you are under that tax, or if you are well below that, and you don't make enough money to survive right now, then remember, increasing those tax brackets at those later values, that didn't affect you either. And yet, somehow, because of the omission of marginal tax, when people talk about taxes like this, because they don't talk about how our tax system actually works... This works as a very convenient scare tactic. If you already don't make enough to survive and somebody says we're going to increase taxes and that's all you hear, you understandably freak the fuck out. Because from your perspective, oh my god, I already don't make enough to pay for everything. However will I pay for it when more of my money is taken out? The reality is, though, here's the reality of things. None of that matters. I'm going to tell you why. Not only did you not make enough money to be affected by any of these taxes in the first place, but two, by not having these higher taxes, did you know that that actually makes your life more difficult? That actually makes it harder for you to live? It sounds counterintuitive, but let me explain. When we tax rich people and corporations at these higher rates... Not only are they normal people like you and me, and therefore they can survive off of the amount of money they were making before that $400,000 mark anyways, but when we do not tax them the way that these taxes are set up for, we have less money in the coffers to pay for things like public health care, which we should be funding, but we don't, not to a significant degree. There is less money in the coffers paying for schools, even though those are paid for incorrectly as well. We have less money in the coffers to pay for everything. Food stamps, that's funded publicly. There's less money for food stamps, and therefore less money to go around for those of you who are at those lower echelons in pay. 
When we do not tax people at these tax rates, there is less money to make sure that your life can significantly improve. We have less money to pay for roads. We have less money to pay for public libraries. We have less money to pay for all kinds of infrastructure. Things that make your life function, infrastructure you rely on, all goes out the window if we don't have the money to pay for it. And mind you, we are the richest nation in the world. We have the money to pay for it. But when language like this is used, like what BGR is using, then it can freak you out because you look at this and think, oh my God, how will I pay for things? When the reality is, when you look at this, you should be going, oh my God, I can now afford things. I'm not having to spend as much money on transportation because it's publicly funded now. I don't have to buy a car because there are more buses. Or, God forbid, we might have trains. How am I going to afford food? Well, your food can be taken care of then through public funding. How am I going to afford my medical expenses? Well, those can be taken care of as well through public funding. Never let somebody spook you with these bogus numbers. Because while the numbers themselves may be real, by ignoring the fact that they are all marginal and proportional to your income bracket, they sound scarier than they really are, and they give you reason to panic when you already can't afford to panic in your current state anyway. But that's that's a that's a long-winded response to this one part of the BGR article. We've got more to go. So here he tries to justify capitalism through the Bible. He said the Bible supports the concept of what a man earns as his, and this is God his God-given right, and it's found in the tenth commandment: Thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's house, thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's wife, nor his manservant, nor his midservant, nor his ox, nor his ass, nor anything that is thy neighbor's. This is a very libertarian view of the Bible. A very every man is an island view of the Bible. But I'd like to juxtapose this instead by pointing out that bringing up biblical verses one by one can be fought by bringing up other biblical verses one by one. How about I do some things instead that might demonstrate the kind of God Christians would like to believe their God to be and use that instead of trying to use various Bible verses. Do you know the story of Moses? I have a question. When Moses' people were enslaved and he got them out of Egypt and took them across the Red Sea, how were his people fed? How did that happen? Also, yeah, there's a, you literally can just bring up render unto Caesar and now suddenly taxes are justified. Like, boom, shut, shut the fuck up, BGR. You know, manna came from the sky and fed the Israelites. Where did that come from? Well, it was given by God. What did they have to do to earn it? Nothing. They merely had to be Israelites around Moses. That's all they needed to do. And then when they complained that they were getting sick of manna, quail started flying in. So they started eating quail and manna. Now, there's something to be said about only having a handful of things to eat and therefore uh, God not understanding the humans that he actually created. But regardless, food was plentiful and given to them for free. Why? Because you needed to survive. If you need something to survive, I would argue it's a human right. And if something is a human right, I would argue we shouldn't have to pay for it. You need health care to survive. You need food and water to survive. Now, I have another question. Let's talk about some other things. Because th this whole part, this whole part is literally just him using Bible verses to justify capitalism. What matters to me is the actual actions that God has taken within the Bible. Let's think of another action that the God of the Bible has taken. So what happened uh, when Jesus was on earth and he found a leper? What did he ask of a leper before he would heal him? What did the leper owe him? How did the leper pay for his health care? And if you're already typing in the comment section that he didn't do that, he didn't actually have to pay for his health care, be it in shekels and silver or in any type of labor, then that is the essence of the God that Christians believe they worship. BGR, I understand that you want to use the Bible to justify all kinds 
all kinds of things, especially capitalism. But I want to tell you that the actual actions that your god has taken have been those of providing for people at no cost to them. If Jesus were here right now, would he make you pay for your health care? Likely not. Let's go ahead and move further into what BGR has in his article. I disagree with his concept of his deity because the deity that Christians claim their God to be is not as awful as the way that BGR wants him to be. BGR needs his deity to be an awful person. Socialism and communism trample the God-given right of private property. Communism does to a greater extent than socialism in that communism allows no private property as all property is owned by and distributed by the state. Ah, we've already got a problem. No. All property is not owned and distributed by the state. So then socialism violates God's law by having the government come in and seize a man's private property and distribute that property to another. Okay, so... We have, a, we have a blatant misunderstanding of what these two economic systems are. Now, mind you that the variance within socialism and communism are as varied as the variance within capitalism. There are higher and lower levels of freedom and margins within capitalism, and they change based on where capitalism is being utilized. What is socialism? Socialism is when the workers own the means of production. Why do the workers own the means of production within socialism? Because they are the ones who produce the goods. They are the ones who do the labor. Without them, the factory does not run. They are essential to making that factory run. You can use the argument, oh, but the money that bought the factory was important too. I would argue that it is largely a non-factor. We can build things for free so long as the material is available and that material can also be given for free so long as an agreement is there but that material being publicly owned also helps as well even once you construct a factory who owns a house is it is it better for a house to be owned by the person who pays for the house or is it better for a house to be owned by the person who uses the house a little bit different when we're talking about a corporation for instance but I would argue that largely the people who care more about the success of any company are going to be the people who work at that company. The stockholders, the shareholders, the CEOs, and even the owner, they care about it as a matter of numbers. The people within the company care about it as a matter of pride. What's happening here, though, is he's ignoring the fact that communism does not seize all property and then distribute it. Communism has private property owned by, well, it's not even by the state. We've already got a problem. Communism allows no private property to be owned and distributed by the state. This is already a bit of a lie. Communism, boiled down to its basic bits, is a stateless, classless, moneyless society. There is no class, because there can be no person who owns the factory. There can be no state to seize the factory. And there can be no money to incentivize the misuse of the factory. Now, Will we ever achieve communism? My answer to that is largely no. I don't think we ever will. But I can understand that as a concept, he's already misunderstood what it is. Now, socialism, I do think, is a little more feasible because, I mean, that'd be why I am a socialist. That word is poisoned in American dialectic because we have an idea of what communism is. We think communism is Russia, Stalin, the Iron Curtain. Ignoring the fact that the same thing can be said for capitalism with America. We are not seen favorably on the world stage by many other countries. Socialism, on the other hand, is an economic system where the proletariat owns the means of production. Private property is not being seized by the state and then distributed to another person. The private property was always owned by the people who worked in that factory. This is why strikes from unions are so effective, and this is why capitalists are terrified of unions and strikes. People know that if you do not have workers inside a building, the building ceases to function if its goal is to produce goods. If people who are in that building stop working, all of them, you can't just hire a whole new set of workers and then everything starts working. How do you train them? If you're deluded enough to think 
that actually know the owner, the CEO, those people, they will train those people. I have to tell you, that's not going to happen. Largely, the people who are on the board of directors, the people who own the factory right now, the people who function as the capital owners, they do not know how to do any of the work. They do not know how to make the forklift work without knife jacking into something. They do not know how to stack a pallet in 10 minutes. They do not know the proper sequence to use to balance the chemicals in whatever Danish you're trying to make. They do not know how to do any of that shit. Because they do not know, they have to hire people who do know. If everybody at a factory says that they are not being treated well, or enough of them are saying they are not being treated well, that they can strike as a union, the factory stops functioning and the owners of the factory stop making money. They have to negotiate now with the people who are in the union. In socialism, the union is not required because the people who own the factory are the union. The workers, as opposed to a system where the workers are having to constantly have a pull and push negotiation with the people who own the company, the company is owned by the workers, and that push and pull is no longer required. That's what socialism is. It is just taking those large businesses and making them owned by the people who already fucking work there. Every single iota of thing that is running that company works exactly the same except the people within the company have the power to dictate what goes on in it, as opposed to somebody above them who doesn't even know how to operate a damn forklift. That's socialism. That is seen as unbiblical by, uh, by BGR. But let's take a look at his conclusion here. There are four ways in God's order, which is the natural order, that an individual may righteously gain property, including money. One, by exchanging their direct labor or ideas to others to gain property or by lending out existing property for others to use. By receiving such property as the spoils of war. Oh, wait a minute. Hold on. Hold on. I thought you were against property theft. BGR, you cannot. You can never. You can never be against property theft if you are okay with number two. If number two is a thing that you like, if this is a thing that you advocate for, you advocate for property theft. What is war other than invading another country you are not supposed to be in and fighting them, either for political, religious, or material gain? And then he also says, by receiving an inheritance, by receiving a freely given gift. Socialism is okay so long as it happens at the end of a violent revolution. That is exactly what this means. 110%. If there were a proletariat rising up of the worker class and all production were to be seized at once by the working class through violence, then that would be a-okay in his book. Because the means of production would simply be the spoils of war that the proletariat rightfully earned. Right, Larry? Because that's what this says. He wants to go on and say that socialism and communism violate the natural order and God's design by forcibly taking one's property and then giving it to another which they did not earn. But one of the criteria he has for earn is, is war. It's a violent revolution. I have never once read through a BGR article and thought at the end of it, wow, I approve of what you advocated for. But in this one instance, I think I've managed that. I think I've managed to find the one thing that BGR advocated for on accident that I'm 100% okay with. You know, in Minecraft. For YouTube purposes. Anyways. As always, everybody, let me know what you think in the comment section below, because I think I've made my uh, my point here abundantly clear. Let me know your thoughts down there. Hit the like button if you haven't already. Subscribe if you haven't already. And as always, everyone, insert end of video tagline here.